This is the Oxford Iron Furnace in Oxford, New Jersey. This furnace was founded in 1743 by a group of people named the Shippens family as well as a man named Joseph Robeson. And if you see that part of the building right there is the actual furnace, so where they would have melted down iron ore and created pig iron. And this furnace actually operated under the Shippens until the early 1800s when it went out of operation. And a few decades later, it was acquired by John Henry and the Scrantons, who are the same men who established the Lackawanna Iron and Steel Works in Scranton, Pennsylvania, which I covered in one of my previous videos. They actually got their start producing iron here. And this was the location where John Henry became the first American to successfully employ the hot blast process for producing iron. And for those of you who have seen my other videos, I did a video on Oxford Tunnel. That's actually located down in that direction. So at the base of that hill, I also did a video on what turned out to be a trussle that was associated with some iron mines and they would have been located in those hills over there and so the hills beyond the trees and actually one of the reasons they established this iron forge here was because this region was rich in locally mined iron ore and that iron ore would have been used to feed this furnace and there are actually a number of other interesting historical buildings around here that is actually a church and that building over there looks like it's, uh, it was at one point a stable. Oxford Furnace was founded by two men, Joseph Shippen Jr. and Jonathan Robeson, both of whom originated from Philadelphia. The Shippenses were a prominent family in colonial Philadelphia, and they acquired a 4,000-acre estate in Oxford in 1741. This land was rich in magnetite iron ore, making an ideal location for iron production. Joseph Shippen Jr., was an officer in the colonial army, and he would later serve as a judge and as the secretary of the state of Pennsylvania. He partnered with Jonathan Robeson, who was an experienced iron worker and would be tasked with building the furnace. They were later joined by Joseph's brother, William Shippen Sr. William was a physician whose patients included men such as Benjamin Franklin, John Hancock, George Washington, and the Marquis de Lafayette. William was also a founder and trustee of Princeton University and he served as one of Pennsylvania's representatives at the Continental Congress. This is another view of the furnace. And as with other blast furnaces, this furnace would have been loaded from the top and the iron, the pig iron and the slag would have been taken out from the bottom. And unlike the furnace in Scranton, this furnace is actually freestanding. So I imagine that that building adjacent to it was actually used to take the iron ore and the charcoal up to the top of the furnace for loading and if you notice that arch right there that would have been where they would have taken the the actual pig iron and the slag out of the furnace and you notice this furnace is actually a pretty rough stonework construction compared to the brickwork of the scranton furnace and of course the actual iron construction of the Bethlehem steel furnace, which I featured in one in other videos. So you can actually see the progression of, of these furnaces from this rough stone stonework to actually brickwork and then to extremely complicated designs like you had at Bethlehem steel. Here's a look down into the furnace. And this would have been where they would have unloaded the pig iron and and extracted the slag as well. And actually, if you can see, I don't know if you can see it from this, um, from the actual video, but you see that great, you see that brickwork and that grate in the center. There's that, you can actually see some remains of ash in the grate work. Let's see if I can zoom in a little. Yeah, I don't think you can see it from the shadows. But this image also gives you a good idea of how thick the bricks around, the stonework around the furnace actually is. So must be a good five, six feet worth of stonework there around the furnace itself. Here's another view into the furnace. And again, you can see how deep the brickwork actually is. So here it actually looks like it's closer to three meters, so about nine feet in depth worth of stonework. And you can also see 
can see the iron grate at the very back of it. And the other thing I noticed is that steel rod coming across this um, arch here. So I actually kind of wonder if this would have been, they would have used steel to reinforce this building. I also notice if you look up there, there's these steel clamps attached to the building. and wrapped around the building, which would have added additional structural support. Although looking at them, they do look like they're quite a bit more modern compared to the 1743 construction of this. So maybe these were added later in the life of this furnace. So they may have been added when it was operating by John Henry and the Scrantons, because if you notice that screw up there, that looks like a modern, modern screw and bolt and I don't think although I guess blacksmiths in the 1700s may be able to do something like that but that looks like it's more produced by machines which would have been more consistent with the 1800s now, this is interesting there's actually a little tree growing out of the forge and here you can see the iron structural support so the bolts and the beams the cross beams i'm actually just going to take a closer look look at them yeah i mean there is a lot of wear and tear on them so they're definitely are pretty old but i still doubt that these bolts would have been part of the original construction, and I'm guessing they might have been something that was added in the 1800s. But yeah, looking up, up at the tree and at the supports. And here you can also see the, see the rough brick fork, which the forge is comprised of. Another thing, interesting thing I noticed, this is actually the side of the attached building, and I noticed these steel hooks coming out of the building and I kind of wonder what they're for. There's one here and then there's another here and it looks like there's was one here that actually got chopped off. So maybe they would have been used to attach something to the furnace or oh yeah and there's an, another one that got chopped off there as well. But just looking up the furnace there's that which would have been a window there and then there's the row of I imagine they would have been steel braces so those steel X's with the bolt in them imagine they would have been braces which would have supported the top level or the top floor of this building also look just looking just looking between the forge and the building. What's interesting is I don't know, don't see any direct attachment between the forge and the adjacent building. So, but I guess that would have made sense because the forge would have been burning hot and they wouldn't have wanted it to be actually attached to this building. And there's, I'm not sure if you can see, but there's another archway down there so there would have been an arch on all four of the sides this sort of like there was in the scranton forges so here's the church and based on a sign over there it is now it is called the oxford colonial united methodist church so that sign right there it looks like it's actually still an operational church and of course the building of the building stone of the church matches the building stone of the forge and seems like it could have been probably was contemporary with the manor house as well. So this is a closer look at the manor house and the Shippens family was originally from Philadelphia and they acquired this land in 1741 and they established the furnace shortly thereafter. So the furnace would have been operational by 1743. So they must have built it immediately upon acquiring the land.
And you can see there's the Oxford Town Green right there. And just a view, there's the stables and there's the church with the furnace behind it. The manor house was built by the Shippen family in 1754 and it is where the brothers resided while operating the furnace. There is a Revolution era flag over the door to commemorate William's role in the Continental Congress as well as Joseph's service in the Continental Army. The furnace would also serve the war effort, producing arms and munitions for the Continental Army. So this is a view from just beside the manor house. So the church is over there and the forge is over there behind it. There's the foundry and the manor house is right there. And from this view, you can actually see how mountainous this region actually is. And the Oxford Tunnel actually would have been in that general direction there. So between us and that hill there, in fact, that hill might even be what it, what the Oxford Tunnel tunneled through. And the Lackawanna Railroad, so the Warren Railroad, which was part of the Lackawanna Old Road would have been, would have traveled through that valley right there. So behind that tree, you see those, those, mountains there would have traveled between where we are now and those mountains and to the left of us is actually so here we're looking to the east and to the right of us would have been south down to washington new jersey and eventually to where the warren railroad intersected with the central Railroad in new jersey and to the left of us would have been the path it took to the Delaware Water Gap. That building right there is actually a foundry which would have been used to transform the pig iron produced by the forge into finished products. And this forge was operational from the mid 1700s to the late 1800s, so it would have been early on would have produced probably simple simple iron steel goods but later in its life it was actually used to produce steel products for railroad construction so it would have been used to produce the steel for locomotives and for railroad cars as well as for the tracks and the various other steel products required by railroads and of course just to give you another view of the manor house the church is behind me and the forge would be off to the left it turns out that the church was originally a grist mill that was built by jonathan robeson's grandson david morris robeson in 1813 Morris did not operate the furnace, instead focusing on running the mill, along with a store and some local farmland. The mill was probably powered by water from Furnace Lake, taking advantage of the infrastructure already established for the furnace. The mill ceased operation in 1906, after which it was used by a plumbing contractor before being converted to a church in 1913. In 1834, Oxford Furnace was acquired by William Henry. Henry was one of America's pioneering iron workers, and at Oxford, he experimented with the hot blast technique for producing iron. In the hot blast process, air is preheated in a stove, then pumped into the blast furnace, which is loaded with coke and iron oil. Coke is a coal-based fuel that consists of a high content of carbon with few impurities. It is produced through the destructive distillation in which coal or oil is heated in the absence of air. In the furnace, the hot air ignites the coke which melts the iron ore producing pig iron and slag, which are extracted from the base of the furnace. This contrasts to previous methods where fuel such as coal is burned in the furnace with cold air being fed into the furnace to fuel the fire. Henry's work at Oxford was the first successful application of the hot blast technique in the Americas and has significantly reduced the time required for iron production, increasing the furnace's overall productivity by 10%. Henry later added a hot blast oven to the top of the furnace's stack 
which increased the temperature of the hot blast and further increased the furnace's productivity by 40%. Henry was aided in operating Oxford Furnace by his son-in-law, Selden T. Scranton, and Selden's brother, George W. Scranton. Henry and the Scrantons would go on to found the Lackawanna Iron Steel Works in Scranton, Pennsylvania, where they applied the techniques they perfected in Oxford on a far larger scale. I previously did a video on the Lackawanna Iron and Steel Works, and I'll leave a link to that if anyone is interested. In 1859, Oxford Furnace was incorporated into the Oxford Iron Company, initially under the control of George and Selden. However, George would lead the partnership, leaving control of the furnace to Selden. Oxford Furnace would prosper during the Civil War, and in 1963, Oxford Iron Company would acquire the ship and manor and the property surrounding the furnace. This image shows what the furnace would have looked like in the later half of the 19th century. The front building housed a steam engine used to blow air into the furnace. The boilers for this engine were on the upper floor. To the back is the furnace with the hot blast stoves atop it, and the shack to the side is a casting shed. In 1871, Selden would establish a second furnace at Oxford. However, this would turn out to be very unfortunate timing because he used most of his financial resources to build the new furnace, and he was still perfecting its operation when the Panic of 1873 hit. The furnace would go bankrupt in 1874, and after a protracted struggle, it would be blown out in 1884, ending its 141 years of operation. The second furnace would live on, being acquired by the Empire Steel and Iron Company. In 1910, this furnace was rebuilt to incorporate a turbo blower, the first use of such a device in the United States. It continued to produce iron through the First World War before being blown out in 1921. Furnace 2 would subsequently be dismantled, ending 180 years of iron production at the site. In 